the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy feast day. Happy feast day. <laughs> the Holy Fathers on this feast see so many profound things which the Lord is doing for his disciples and bringing them closer to him and assuring them and comforting them and giving them the power that they need to go forth from that point on to give them assurances. I was reading late last night at St. Theophon the Recluse and looking at this feast took it away I never thought about which was that he quoted St. Paul in his fourth chapter of the, of course, the epistle to the Ephesians where Paul is actually quoting David from the 67th Psalm where he says that it's a sin, he who ascended on high led captivity captive and gave gifts to all men. He who ascended on high, of course, is our Savior. And leading captivity captive has, of course, multiple meanings. Of course, he led captivity captive when he conquered Hades and took away that bondage of death and destroyed the gates of hell. But he also leads captivity captive when he ascends into heaven, as St. Theophon talks about. He mentions just briefly in passing, I wish he had gone a little bit farther with it, just a little excerpt they had, was that it was much unto an army conquering a people and then taking spoils from those people. He had something going there very profound, because often in the Old Testament, of course, there are times when the people of Israel told not to take those spoils because of the various idol worshippers they have conquered. There's other times when they are told to take spoils. Of course, from the Egyptians being one of them. But in this case, the Lord has certainly taken spoils because he went into that foreign kingdom, that kingdom of Hades. He went to the enemy tyrant, the emperor of that kingdom, Satan himself. He destroys him, binds him with chains, and he takes spoils. And those spoils he had, of course, were the treasures that Satan had. And those treasures were us, was mankind, those people. He led captivity captive because he took us who were captive, our flesh, our souls, our spirits, and took us up to the right hand of God the Father. As he goes out in this passage from Luke with the people, with his disciples, the first thing he does is standing in the midst of them. He makes a point of that, right among them. He says, peace be unto you, as he often does when he comes to them offering his peace as the church does so often in its, in its uh, litanies and throughout the divine services. And you share, of course, and wish peace upon me or whichever priest is serving. And that is God's peace we are wishing. And he's wishing his disciples that peace. Of course, he can grant that peace, which he is trying to do. But yet, they stand there very fearful. Because they still don't seem to quite get it. Even after seeing him for 40 days, even after seeing him appear through doors that are shut and the various miracles. They haven't had the Holy Spirit poured out upon them yet as we have. So they have, they certainly have ample excuse. It will be given shortly. But to assure them even further, he shows to them that a spirit does not have flesh and blood as you see me have. And he shows them his hands and his feet. Of course, those hands and feet that were wounded and while, of course, his body is greatly transfigured, as our bodies can be greatly transfigured in the resurrection, he still bears those wounds, because those wounds happened. They're eternal for us. They happened for our salvation. You may notice in the icon, in some icons it's more evident that the Lord's robes are sort of tinged with a reddish color, a light scarlet color emphasizing that he did go through that passion, emphasizing the blood that he did shed for the life of the world. And he assures them further by taking fish and a honeycomb. Did he need these things? No. People that have died and resurrected do not need earthly food anymore. The fathers make a point that he does this to show them that he does have a body as we have had a body. Of course, they go into great details about the fish and the honeycomb as well. I'll save that for another time. But he, said, their fathers say that these divine energies of his burn up this food. Of course, he doesn't have a stomach to digest the food in the way we have. He's a transfigured being. And assuring them, he, of course, tells them 
from the scriptures, the prophets, and the law, and who he is again, teaching them what they need to be teaching. Telling them, of course, we heard in the gospel last night of Mark, to go out and preach the gospel to all creatures, to all the world. Wait in Jerusalem until power is given from on high, which they don't understand yet. They will shortly. They emphasize that he went out a Sabbath day's journey. Well, this, of course, isn't the Sabbath. But in Christ, everything is a Sabbath. It is that spiritual rest of peace in our hearts in which those apostles had these days of Sabbath rest, waiting on the coming of the Holy Spirit. We are to live our lives in such a manner as well, in a Sabbath rest. It doesn't mean we're not working, but it means that we maintain peace in our hearts without reacting to everything around us, whether the thoughts or the people, to act with dispassion that our hearts might receive Christ, may be fit vessels of the Holy Spirit. We say in our three communion prayers, that prayer of St. Simeon Metaphrastes, that by partaking of the Holy Communion, we may also sit at the right hand of the Father. You know, Christ who was ascended and glory is sat at the right hand of the Father. By my partaking of thy holy mysteries, may obtain a place at the Father's right hand as well. That's what we desire. Because the partaking of this flesh and blood, and blood of Christ, we partake of his divinity. And our earthly flesh, much as he raised up our flesh to heaven, is taken up with himself. And he has that glory which you had before the world was. This is an important feast for our salvation. Sunday, we celebrate the feast of the 318 fathers of the Council of Nicaea in 325 labored so mightily for the teaching of the church that all of these details matter. And this one, of course, is not a small detail because if Christ is not risen and if Christ is not ascended, then neither are we risen and ascend, can we ascend in glory with Christ. But now that he has ascended and sat at the right hand of the Father, he becomes that forerunner into paradise, proclaiming the good news of the coming of peace as St. John the Forerunner proclaimed it as a forerunner into Hades. The salvation of mankind, that Christ would be coming there. Now Christ proclaims our coming into heaven. His resurrection was like no other resurrection, and that there had been other resurrections. Think of Elijah and Elisha raising up young men who had died. Other people had been brought from the dead, but of course they died again and had to go through life and all of its pains. Christ's resurrection conquered death. He did not have to die again. Christ's ascension is also different. The fathers point out, John Chrysostom, but particularly there have been other ascensions, a backward flying through the air to, to give food unto Daniel, and of course, Elijah. The fathers, particularly Gregory Palamas, point out that his resurrection, of course, his ascension is different than Elijah's because the Greek actually says like unto heaven. A little bit different, a type of what Christ did. Elijah doesn't rise up completely as Christ does to the right hand of God the Father. He too needs a redeemer. And he too has a redeemer in Christ. And because of this glorious ascension, we too can sit at the right hand of God the Father. Glory to our risen Christ who has ascended in glory for us. Amen. Amen.